Hello again, everyone. This is a revision session for section 5 of the edXL IGCSE physics specification for pH 0. If you've got your syllabus booklet, again, have it open. Uh, if not, Googling that phrase should find you what you need. Uh, we're starting on, uh, or the syllabus starts on page 3, and we're looking at section 5, which starts on page 16. It's called solids, liquids, and gases. I'm going to do this in, uh, in an almost reverse order of 5b, 5c, 5d, and then finishing with 5a. So first of all, <coughs> 5b, density and pressure. A couple of equations to know and a couple of facts to know about density and pressure of different, uh, different substances. Uh, you need to know that density is mass over volume. We use the letter rho, which looks like a p for density mass divided by volume, you need to know, uh, you need to be able to describe experiments for how you would measure the densities of objects. Obviously, if you've got a nice easy object like that, you just measure length, uh, depth, height, multiply them together, that will give you the volume. And then for the mass, you put it on a set of, now don't say scales, the exam board are fussy about this, uh, the thing that you measure mass with is called a balance, so you put it on a set of balances. If you've got an irregular shape, like a stone, you obviously can't measure length, width, and height, so uh, you might remember the old technique of putting it in a measuring cylinder with some water in, stick the object in, the water goes up, and the amount the water goes up in millilitres uh, is equal to the volume in centimetres. So if the reading went up by 16 millilitres, uh, the volume would be 16 centimetres cubed and you can then put that into that equation and you can stick your stone on a set of balances again to get the mass and hey presto you've got the density. Another equation is pressure so that's a P not a rho that's a Greek letter rho for density that's a uh, western letter P for um, pressure. Uh, force over area is the definition of pressure you probably know that from uh, a few years ago um, and uh, it's just a case of putting in numbers. Force is measured in newtons Area is measured in square metres, and pressure is therefore either in newtons per square metre, or if you measure the area in centimetres, you could have it in newtons per square centimetre. A newton per square metre is exactly the same as a pascal. So if you see pressures measured in pascal, it's just another way of saying newtons per square metre. If you're in a gas or a liquid uh, at rest, so let's say you've got a swimming pool, is probably a good example, um, and you've got a uh, something like a brick maybe on the bottom of your swimming pool, uh, the pressure at that point in the swimming pool acts equally in all directions at that particular depth. If you lifted the brick up to there, there would be less pressure because it's, uh, there's not as much water on top pushing down, but it would still be acting in the same amount in all directions, upwards, left, right, downwards, the lot. That uh, doesn't just go in liquids, that goes for gases as well. So if you have... Um, uh, if you think about atmospheric pressure on uh, a tree, let's say, then atmospheric pressure acts in all directions equally. It's obviously just a lot less than the pressure you get in a swimming pool, but it's still there and it's still acting in all directions, whether it's a gas or a liquid. You need to know uh, a third equation for pressure difference. This is what you'd use in a swimming pool, for example. If you knew the depth of the swimming pool, if you knew the height of that water, um, on top of you when you're at the bottom, then the pressure due to the water at the bottom of the swimming pool uh, would be the density of the water, which they tell you in the question, multiplied by the gravitational field strength, which, assuming you're on the surface of the Earth, is going to be 10, and they'll tell you that in the question, and then the height of the swimming pool. So uh, in, in a swimming pool, for example, um, density of water is about 1,000 kilograms per cubic metre, Gravitational field strength, we usually use 10, and if that's, let's say, a 4 metre deep swimming pool, then 1,000 times 10 times 4 is 40,000, and uh, we've done everything in kilograms and metres squared and so on, so uh, that means the density will come out in kilograms per cubic, uh, sorry, the pressure will come out in newtons per square metre, which, as we remember before, is the same as 40,000 pascals, or you could even say 40 kilopascals if you wanted to all the same thing. So that's 5b. 5c, changes of state. Um, this is all fairly straightforward stuff that, again, you've probably known for years. Solid, liquid, gas. Uh, you need to know the words to go from uh, one to the other. Um, so uh, solid to liquid, for example, ice going to wa liquid water is obviously called melting. Um, liquid to gas is called evaporating. It can also be called boiling. 
Now the two are not the same. Evaporating can happen at any temperature. So a puddle of water on a reasonably warm day evaporates, whereas boiling only happens at one specific temperature, which is obviously called the boiling point. So you don't refer to the evaporating point of water, you refer to the boiling point of water, 100 Celsius. Um, obviously you wouldn't talk about a puddle of water outside on a rainy day, you wouldn't talk about it boiling away, you'd talk about it evaporating away. It makes more sense that way. Uh, you need to know about the arrangement and motion of the particles in solids, liquids and gases. So in solids, uh, nice regular arrangement, nice and tightly packed. In a liquid, still tightly packed. A common misconception is that they are uh, more spread apart. They're a tiny amount spread apart, but not to any noticeable extent. What's different, what's different is that in a solid, they're all regularly arranged. And in a liquid, they're a bit more jumbled. And they fill the container that way, whereas a solid will just sit there. Uh, in a gas, obviously, everyone remembers that one, usually, they fly around very, very fast. They vibrate here and they vibrate here, but they fly around like crazy in a gas. Uh, you need to know about something called Brownian motion. This is 5.9 on the syllabus. Brownian motion. Um, you probably saw it through a microscope, uh, some smoke particles being lit up with a red or a green laser, perhaps, uh, if that rings a bell. If not, if you go on YouTube and search for Brownian motion, uh, you'll find there's lots of videos there showing you what you're looking for. When you look through a microscope at smoke particles that are strongly lit up, uh, you see the smoke particles as little dots of light against a dark background, and you see them jiggling around like crazy, completely randomly and constantly. They never stop. And we explain that by saying that the smoke particles are large and they're being hit, they're being buffeted from all sides by air molecules, which are smaller, you can't see. So the, uh, you see just the smoke particle bouncing around. What you don't see is the air particles um, causing that vibration. But you, um, yeah, you explain it by saying that the air particles are there. So it's good evidence that uh, air is, uh, is made of particles and that they're in constant random motion. When you've got uh, a container with uh, particles uh, as a gas, so a gas cylinder, for example, uh, the particles bounce off the walls. When they bounce off the walls, uh, they're being um, accelerated. They're, ex uh, they're exerting a force on the walls. Um, so you have a force. The walls obviously have an area. And if you have a force in an area, as you remember from, the, from 5B, uh, uh, you have a pressure. So that's how gas molecules exert a pressure, by colliding with the walls and exerting a force on an area. You need to know about absolute zero, that's the lowest temperature possible. Uh, when you cool something down, the particles vibrate less and less and less. Logically, there must come a point where the particles stop vibrating, and that temperature is called absolute zero. And if you measure it, it's minus 273 degrees Celsius. That's also known as zero Kelvin. Um, so the Kelvin temperature scale uh, is exactly the same as the Celsius temperature scale, it's just that zero is a, it starts at absolute zero instead of starting at the freezing point of water. Uh, you, need to know, uh, you need to be able to convert between the two, so the temperature in a room, for example, might be 20 degrees C, which is the same as, there's obviously a difference of 273 between the two, so 20 degrees C is the same as 293 Kelvin. Water boils at 100 degrees C, so that's the same as 373 Kelvin and so on. Just add or subtract 273. You can always tell if you've made it or uh, if you do make a mistake with Kelvin temperatures, you can often spot it. If ever you come up with a negative number for a Kelvin temperature, you must have made a mistake because the lowest temperature possible is zero and you can't get lower than that, so you can't get negative numbers. So you should always be able to spot that sort of mistake before you write it down. Uh, if you increase the temperature of a gas, you find that it's proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles. Um, that only works if the temperature is measured in Kelvin. So if you increase the temperature of a gas from 200 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin, let's say, and the average kinetic energy of the particles was uh, one microjoule, um, then at 400 Kelvin, uh, if you double the Kelvin temperature, you double the average kinetic energy, so the average kinetic energy would be two microjoules and if you doubled it again to 800 Kelvin it would double again to 4 microjoules and so on. Just a little rule that they expect you to know. Um, you have a couple of gas laws as well. Uh, the first one listed in the syllabus is P1 divided by T1 is P2 divided by T2. So that's the pressure 
in, um, uh, in a container or the pressure being exerted by a gas, and those are the temperatures of the gas. Uh, and this assumes that you keep the volume constant, like for example in a car tyre. The temperature of a car tyre changes but the volume stays the same, so therefore the pressure uh, must increase. So they might give you two temperatures and um, a cold, maybe a colder temperature and a hotter temperature. At the colder temperature they'll say the car tyre pressure is this much, calculate the car tyre pressure when it's at this temperature. Because this also only works if the temperature is in Kelvin, a very common trick is to give you the temperature in degrees Celsius and then um, you won't get any marks if you forget to convert it to Kelvin, so make sure you do again just add 273 each time. Slightly easier gas law to use is uh, pressure and uh, involves pressure and volume. Pressure 1 times volume 1 equals pressure 2 times volume 2. Uh, so you might be doing this uh, in a uh, sort of diving situation perhaps. So um, a balloon at the surface of a swimming pool has a volume of this at a pressure of this. And it's then taken deeper in the water where the pressure is this. Calculate what the volume will be. Obviously the higher the pressure, the smaller of the volume of the balloon so you just stick all the numbers in and uh, get the answer out for volume there's no kelvin thing to worry about there so it's just use whatever units they give you as long as you're using the same units on both sides it doesn't matter so that's gas laws uh, going on to uh, in fact that's actually most of that. that that actually deals with ideal gas molecules as well so there's only units left to do um, degrees celsius that's temperature kelvin that's also temperature and we know about those now Joules, energy, kilograms, obviously mass, kilograms per cubic metre, that's density, mass divided by volume, metres, obviously distance, metres squared, that's area, metres cubed, that's volume, people often get those two mixed up, metres squared, definitely always area, metres cubed, definitely always volume, metres per second, metres per second squared, that's acceleration, you might remember from um, section one of the syllabus, Newtons, that's force, and Pascals, that's pressure, which is obviously the same as a Newton per square metre, as we said right at the beginning. So there you go. That's the information. A quick recap. Uh, the most important thing to do now is go and actually practice some uh, questions from your books.